begin. Today we are going to be in the book of Habakkuk, a book you probably read at least once in your life. Um, <laughs> great book, by the way. If you're looking for it, it's in the Old Testament, and uh, it's in the, the section of the little ones, the, the minor prophets. You'll find it back there uh, between Nahum and Zephaniah, two other great books that you maybe haven't visited in a while, but a uh, great, great little book with a, a great word for us today. We are talking about finding a treasure in troubled times today. Uh, Habakkuk certainly knew something of this subject and certainly offers us some great advice on it. On the screen behind me, you're going to see an image that you might be familiar with, one you have probably seen at some point in your life, maybe. Uh, if we get that up there, there it is. What is that? Earth. For those of you who uh, are listening on the radio, uh, we got a picture of the globe up there, Earth from a couple thousand miles away. It's beautiful, isn't it? Earth, this place we call home. Particularly when you look at it from this perspective and from this distance. You see that pretty deep blue water contrasting against the dark greens of the Amazon. You see those swirling clouds all over the surface. Looks like a very quiet, peaceful, nice, majestic, beautiful place. Let's zoom in a little bit more. We'll get a little bit closer to earth and uh, on this picture here, you can see the perspective of the International Space Station. You maybe have seen pictures like this at different times in your life. Or if you get on Google Images, you can go and see a bunch of them. They're beautiful as well. The dark blues, the cloud, the perspective of it all. You're zooming in a little bit more here. About 250 miles above the Earth is where the International Space Station orbits around. And again, it looks peaceful down below. Quiet, majestic, beautiful. But what happens when you really zoom in? What, what happens if you were to zoom in all the way into your own home or into your children's school? What happens when you, you zoom in to the county in which you live or the country in which you live? What happens when you actually get down here on the surface is it doesn't look near as pretty, does it? It doesn't look near as beautiful or as peaceful or majestic. In fact, when you zoom in and you get down here on the surface, the reality is we see things like increased turmoil and tragedy everywhere we turn. We see unprecedented terrorism. And not just the presence of terrorism, which we have grown far too accustomed to, in our modern world, but we now see the tolerance of terrorism. We don't just see it in faraway places across oceans and thousands of miles away. We see it on our campuses, in our own country. We see it inside of our own government. We see terrorism being tolerated at a level that many of us, I would suspect most of us in this room, never imagined it would be. We see seemingly unending tragedies. We see a, a dirty planet that is being polluted. The air, the water, the land, everywhere you look, people pay little respect to the planet in which we live. We see immorality and sin at unprecedented levels. The immorality is much like the terrorism. It's not just tolerated though it's promoted again right in front of our eyes it's in your kids textbooks it's on every screen and every device that you own it's no longer being tolerated it's actively being promoted in your life it's being pushed in front of you and it's even being pushed by some of you without even knowing you're doing it because you've become so numb to it it's so normal it's so germane these days that no one even bats an eyelash you see when you zoom in on that beautiful planet and you look at it for what it really is you are faced with this 
inescapable tension and that ever-present reality. You see, down here, our planet looks a lot less like a peaceful, majestic, beautiful globe with the backdrop of the universe that God created behind it. Down here, it looks a whole lot more like one of those black balls that has a fuse coming out the top that's been lit and it's quickly burning, and we are all bracing for an explosion that we know is going to happen. If you look from afar, things look one way, but if you look up close, things look much different, don't they? Today, I I want us to consider this text from the book of Habakkuk, not a book you hear a lot of sermons from, not a book you've probably read much in your life, but a powerful book when we're trying to find treasure in the face of tension treasure in the face of turmoil and tragedy in which we live and have to face every day. Not much is known about the man who wrote and penned these words other than the fact that he was a prophet of God. But the book in which he wrote, this short three-chapter book, was written in a time of international crisis and great national corruption. Sound familiar? The international crisis that Habakkuk was facing in his day was extremely serious. We don't have time today, unfortunately, to dive into all the details of it. But it was a serious international crisis that was going to affect the country in which he lived. But even more serious and more concerning to Habakkuk was the national crisis that was happening within his own borders, happening inside of Judah. There was moral depravity. There was no fear or respect for God or His Word. There was the tolerance of and the promotion of sin. There was government corruption. And much, much more that created this environment, this situation to which God had to speak. And he chose to speak through this prophet. And essentially what the Lord says is, I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. I want to read to you as we begin from a commentary that was written in 1983. I give you the year. Because the words you're about to hear, it's important you understand the context. They were written in 1983 about this book, kind of a summary of the book, Habakkuk. It says this, no wonder Habakkuk looked at all the corruption and asked, why doesn't God do something? Godly men and women continue to ask similar whys in a world of increasing international crises and internal corruption. Nation rises up against nation around the world, and sin abounds at home. World powers aim at an ever-increasing array of complex nuclear weapons at each other while they sit around tables and talk about peace. World War III seems incredibly imminent. While the stage is set for a global holocaust, the likes of which we haven't even seen yet, While that stage is being set, there's an unsuspecting audience at home, America, that fiddles a happy tune. The nation's moral fiber is being eaten away by a playboy philosophy that makes personal pleasure the supreme rule of life. Hedonism catches fire while homes crumble. Crime soars while the church sours. Drugs, divorce, and debauchery prevail, and decency dies. Fickleness dances in the street while faith is being buried. And God we trust has become a meaningless slogan that's just stamped on our corroding coins that have an ever-decreasing value to them. In such a world of crisis and chaos, Habakkuk speaks with great clarity. This little book is as contemporary as your morning newspaper. Those words were written in 1983. Imagine, for those of you who are old enough to remember 1983, how much has changed and how different, and not in a good way, the world is today versus then. If this book was that relevant then, I would offer this advice to you this morning. It's even more relevant to us now. Perhaps the greatest lesson in this book for believers today is that in the face of such a wicked and sinful world, we can still be filled with thanksgiving gratitude and joy. Our text for today comes right at the end of the book. It's the final verses 
after he's gone through all of these questions of God and God has let him know what's going to happen. Here's what Habakkuk concludes in chapter 3, starting in verse 16. He says, I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones and I trembled where I stood. Now, I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. Though the fig tree does not bud and there is no fruit on the vines, and though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though the flocks disappear from the pen and there are no herds in the stalls, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord, my Lord, is my strength. And he makes my feet like those of a deer. He enables me to walk on a mountain heights. Today, Habakkuk will show us and prove to us that gratitude is the key. Just like you need a key to unlock everything in your life, including your phone. You may not have a physical key, but you have a password or a facial ID or some iris scan of your eye or some other cool gadget, I'm sure, to unlock your phone. Or just like you need a key to get into your vehicle or your business or your home, God has given us a key to get into sacred places even in the midst of turmoil and tragedy. He's given us a key that will open a door to peace, a key that will open a door to joy and happiness and contentment and even hope in the darkest times. Habakkuk shows us that gratitude, thankfulness, is the key that opens those doors. This key helps us open doors into things like point number one for us today. This key helps us to do things like trust in God's timing. Trusting in God's timing is not always easy. It can be very difficult, and sometimes it's harder than others. I don't know about y'all, but one of the hardest things in life is waiting, isn't it? And it, it doesn't matter what you're waiting for. Waiting is just hard. doesn't matter if you're waiting in a traffic jam or if you're waiting for your ice cream to come after your meal. Waiting is hard. It doesn't matter if you're waiting for a medical diagnosis or some test to return to tell you what you have or don't have, or if you're waiting for a loved one to get back from a trip or maybe even just home from work. Waiting can be hard. But it's even harder when you don't understand what's happening it's even harder when you don't know why you have to wait. <laughs> I'll give you an example that I think helps bring some clarity to my thought on that. Something you've done and I've done, we've all done, when you're waiting in a traffic jam. If, if I'm waiting in a traffic jam and I can, for example, see up ahead, see some flashing lights and maybe a helicopter coming in to land or some indication of what's going on, or maybe it's just a construction zone I can see up ahead, I tend to, to, to wait a little better and wait a little different than if I can't see anything at all. If, if I see up there those flashing lights indicating that there's been a bad accident, for example, I'll tend to, tend to, in my waiting, pray. I'll pray for the first responders. I'll pray for the people who are in the accident. And I just wait. Because I, I know there's people up there in need. I know there's people up there doing their best. I know that the situation is being handled. I, I know that if I was in that situation, I would want someone to pray for me and wait patiently. So, so I just wait. But if I'm in a traffic jam and I can't see what's causing the delay, let's say the delay is five miles ahead or 10 miles ahead or around a corner or over a hill. Well, then I get pretty frustrated pretty fast. In fact, that's when I start thinking about like, putting it in four by four and just getting in the grass and going around everybody or getting up onto the access road or doing the other popular thing that everybody likes to do these days, just drive through somebody's fence and make my own road. <laughs> they can do it. Why can't I? But I, the bottom line is I don't want to wait because I can't see what's up there. I can't see what I'm waiting for. You see, the difference in those two situations is really gratitude when you boil it down. When you get down to exactly what the difference is, the, the difference is gratitude. If I'm waiting in the case of an accident, I'm thankful that I'm not in that accident. I'm grateful and thankful that there are people up there helping them. 
I'm grateful and thankful that there's a hospital staff waiting to receive them to, to help them. I'm grateful and thankful that even though I'm going to be late and even though I'm delayed and even though there's problems, my problems aren't as big as their problems. And when I can't see whatever it is, well, there's little to be grateful for and there's just a whole lot to be frustrated about. You see, gratitude is the key. It's the same when you're trying to trust God's timing. Look at what Habakkuk says in verse 16. I heard and I trembled within. My lips quivered at the sound. Rottenness entered my bones. I trembled where I stood. And then he says, now I must quietly wait for the day of distress to come against the people invading us. He says, now I must quietly wait for God to act. I must quietly wait for God to do what God can only do. I must quietly wait for God to move. Now, I don't know about you, waiting is one thing, but waiting quietly is another. I think that word quietly is there for me. To remind me that when I'm waiting on God, when I'm waiting on God's time, and I should indeed wait quietly. Despite knowing and despite sensing all this great pain that Habakkuk has spoken of and all the destruction that is on its way to Judah, Habakkuk doesn't lose his mind. He doesn't lose his hope. He doesn't lose his confidence in God because he knew that ultimately God was going to be glorified, that God would be victorious. He knew that he could indeed quietly wait on the Lord's timing for whatever was going to happen. He knew that God was trustworthy. He knew that God was in control. So he made a choice to trust the Lord and wait for his perfect timing, even in this awful situation. I want you to notice and I want you to know that the Lord had not answered all of his questions when he decided to quietly wait. The Lord had not solved all of the world's problems of his day when he decided to quietly wait. The Lord had not created an easier path for Habakkuk and the people who surrounded him and his nation. In fact, their path is going to be very difficult. But he still decided to quietly wait for the Lord. Because there was a level of trust in God's timing inside of this man that I believe sprang from a source of gratitude within his heart. You see, he knew above all else God was faithful. And he knew he could trust God's timing. He was grateful for the faithfulness of God. When you know that God is faithful, when you believe that God is faithful, when you embrace the fact and the reality that God is faithful, it creates inside of you a deep sense of gratitude. A gratitude in your life that becomes a key that opens these doors. You do know that God is faithful, right? The Apostle Paul said it like this, in 2 Thessalonians, to the Thessalonians who, by the way, had their own troubles, their own trials, their own tragedies of their day. To them, Paul wrote this in verse 3, but the Lord is faithful. He will strengthen you and guard you from the evil one. We have confidence in the Lord about you, that you're doing and will continue to do what we commanded. May the Lord direct your hearts to God's love and Christ's endurance. In Lamentations, the Old Testament, chapter 3, verse 22, it says this, verse 22, Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish, for His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say the Lord is my portion, therefore I will put my hope in Him. Second Timothy, another letter written with tragedy and turmoil and chaos all around, Chapter 2, verse 11, this saying is trustworthy, Paul writes, For if we died with him, we will also live with him. And if we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now look at verse 13. There's a shift, a change, and something very important in that verse. He says, if we are faithless, which by the way, we are often, aren't we? He says, if we are faithless, guess what? He remains faithful. Do you see how different that is from even the verse before? If we deny him, he will also deny us. But verse 13 says, if we're faithless, he remains faithful. Because he cannot deny 
himself. Church, it's sad, but it must be said that in America and in the West, and even within the church, the people of God, even within the clergy, the leaders of the church, the people of God, there has developed a false religion in America. A false religion that is built upon a false foundation and a false hope. It teaches a false view of God and thus a false gospel that many have bought into because it's a beautiful gospel. It's a beautiful gospel that's much like the globe you saw at the beginning. From a thousand miles away, it looks great. But when you drill into it, when you get down on the surface of it, it's rubbish. The false gospel says this. It says, here's how you know that God is faithful. You know that God is faithful when everything in your life is rosy and right. Because the whole world is about you and the whole world should bow to you. And everything in all of creation is centered upon you. And so God's faithfulness then becomes connected to everything in your world, in your universe, being rosy and right. If you have money in the bank, well then, yeah, of course God is faithful. If you have four cars in the garage and a boat and an RV in the barn and a lake house and a beach house and a vacation house and three timeshares, well then, of course, God is faithful. If you're healthy, if your kids are making all A's or whatever other nonsense you want to believe in, Well, then, of course, God is faithful. That's how you know God is faithful, because everything's right in your life. Can I tell you the truth? Can I tell you what the Bible says? If you drill into the Bible, here's what it'll teach you about God's faithfulness. It's simple. God is faithful. He's faithful when you're poor. In fact, I would argue you will see and experience and know the faithfulness of God at a deeper level in your poverty than you will in your prosperity. God is faithful. He's faithful when you're sick. He's faithful when you're dying. He's faithful when you're not going to get better. He's faithful when you're hungry. He's faithful when you're thirsty. He's faithful to millions of people who walk to work because they can't afford a bus ticket, much less a vehicle to drive in. He's faithful when you don't have a job. He's faithful when you're being persecuted. He's faithful to the martyr who's being tied up and abused, beaten, cut, burned, hung, crucified. God is faithful. He's faithful when your marriage is falling apart. He's faithful when stuff isn't going well with your children. God is faithful. That's what the Bible teaches, that God is faithful. And God is still faithful because he will always be faithful no matter how unfaithful we become. See, Habakkuk understood that and he was grateful for it. And he knew that because of that, he could trust God's timing so he could quietly wait. Even though he didn't understand it, even though he couldn't comprehend it, Even though he was confused by it, he was willing to quietly wait and trust in God's timing because he was grateful for the faithfulness of God. You see, gratitude becomes a key that can open a door that leads to peace and joy and hope, even in the most trying and difficult times in our life. The second thing we see is what I call triumph in tribulation. We can have victory even in the darkest days. We can triumph even in the greatest trials. Again, these are tough and troubled times Habakkuk is living in, just like the tough and troubled times we're living in. Different but similar. As a prophet, Habakkuk knows what's actually going to happen. God has actually foreshadowed and giving him some really bad news. But Habakkuk does more than just trust in God. He also believed that there was going to be triumph and victory in the tribulation that was coming. In verse 17, he paints a very ominous picture. He says, Though the fig tree does not bud, and there is no fruit on the vines, and though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, and though the flocks disappear from the pen, and there are no herds in the stalls. Now, you have to understand the economy of the world at this time is 
almost exclusively agriculturally related. And so when Habakkuk says all these things are going to happen, there's going to be no fruit on the vine, no fruit on the trees, no olive crop. The fields are going to be empty and produce no food. The flocks are all going to be stolen or destroyed. The herds of cattle are going to go missing for the same reasons. He's painting a picture here of total devastation. He's painting a picture here that anybody in his day would have understood there's going to be great hardship. There's going to be a humanitarian crisis on account of what is going to take place. But even here, he sees great triumph on the horizon in this great tribulation. Look at verse 18. He says, yet I will celebrate in the Lord. Despite all of that, he says, I will celebrate in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. Another translation, the New English translation captures it like this. I will rejoice because of the Lord. I will be happy because of the God who delivers me. I see triumph and victory on the horizon. The English Standard Version says this in verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Here's what I want you to see. This prophet saw the trials. He saw the tragedy. He saw the turmoil. He saw the tension. But even in this, he was thankful and grateful because he understood that God had already won. He understood that God was in control. He understood that the battle that was coming their way was ultimately going to turn into a victory and something that produced glory for God. One commentator put it brilliantly. He put it this way. He said he realized that inner peace did not depend on outward prosperity. Inner peace, the inner peace of this prophet, did not depend on the outward prosperity or the outward circumstances of his life. Imagine for a moment how different your entire world would be if you believed that. Imagine how different your worldview would be if you believed that. Imagine if you got to that place, how much would change? If your peace did not depend upon how much money was in your bank account, if your peace did not depend upon your reputation or what people thought of you or how good your name was, if your peace wasn't tied to your status or to your education or your power or your validity in your community or at your job, if your peace wasn't tied to how many friends you had or how many social events you got invited to, if your peace wasn't tied to your health and how good you felt, if your peace wasn't tied to your security or your understanding and ability to comprehend and make sense of the world that's around you. Imagine if your peace didn't depend on any of that. Imagine for a moment if you were just so thankful that God had saved a wretched sinner like you. Imagine for just a moment if you were just so grateful that God had adopted you into his family and given you the keys to glory. Imagine if you were just so in love with God and just had such a high and holy view of God and the gospel that nothing else in the entire world could steal your peace and joy because for you, salvation was enough. You see, gratitude is the key. But it's so easy to get sidetracked. It's easy to fall into the cycle of cynicism. Paul mentions a thorn in his flesh at one point in the New Testament. It's a good example of how easy it can be for any of us, including the Apostle Paul, to fall into this trap. We don't know what his thorn was or we don't know who it was. There's different views. Some believe maybe it was a physical thorn. Some believe it was some kind of physical health issue he had. Other people believe it was a relationship problem or some issue he had with a person or a group of people. We, we don't know. God doesn't give us the details but here's what we do know about this thorn in the flesh. God chose and decided to remind Paul through that thorn that his grace was all Paul needed. In 2 Corinthians 12, 8 and 9, it says this, concerning this, the thorn, Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me. But he said to me, God, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weaknesses. Therefore, Paul says, I will gladly, most gladly, boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may preside 
reside in me. You see, when Paul's perspective was focused on the grace of God and the reality of God's perfect power in his own personal weakness, he was more than grateful and happy and thankful. But when he was focused on the thorn in his flesh, he fell into that trap that we often fall into ourselves. We lose our grateful heart and our thankfulness. You see, a grateful heart can see triumph even in the face of tribulation. A grateful heart can see triumph even with a thorn in the flesh. Because of the power of God's grace and the power of God's love and the power of God's peace and God's joy. It's why I keep telling you over and over again that gratitude is the key, which is why you should work on it and be disciplined about it. I'll give you one final one for today, and that is this. This key, this thing called gratitude and thankfulness can transform our tears. We have so much information these days. It's hard not to hurt. It's hard not to cry. We see every troubled place on the planet dragged before our eyes every morning and every evening and every hour in between on cable news. We're given constantly these glimpses into political corruption in our own country on a daily basis. We're reminded of greed and how awful people who lead us can be and the selfish decisions they can make to enhance their own profit and their own power. We can literally log onto the internet and get onto social media and watch wars in real time. We can see terrorists with GoPro cameras strapped to their bodies moving through villages live. As it happens, as they slaughter and murder babies and families, as they tie them and burn them and hang them and cook them inside of ovens and then sit at a dinner table and eat the food out of their fridge, we can see it with our own eyes. We can watch it as it happens. We can see the plagues that are happening around the world. We see the effects of starvation. We don't have to look far or look hard to even find it. When you watch the local news, it's not much better. Stabbings, gunshots, mass shootings, bombings, missile strikes. It's all you hear about. Not to mention the kidnappings and the sex trafficking that's happening all around us. And not getting better, we're not getting a handle on it, it's just getting worse. We're constantly and consistently exposed to the troubles of the entire world. And everyone else's trouble is also supposed to be our trouble. We're, we're told we're supposed to worry about it, and we're supposed to fix it, and we're supposed to know about it, and this is a good thing. I'm not sure that it is. Many times I cry out, to God like the psalmist did in Psalms 22, 11, where he said, be not far from me for trouble is near and there is none to help. Because it feels like that when you look at the world around us, not the world from thousands of miles away, not the pretty globe against the backdrop of God's universe. No, when you get down here on the surface of it and you get down in the middle of the mess, There's a lot that will hurt your heart and make you cry. If the current state of our culture doesn't cause you concern, if the current state of our world and the stranglehold sin and Satan has on it doesn't shock you and sadden you, if if you have never looked around and had a moment like Habakkuk where you said, I heard and I trembled within, my lips quivered at the sounds, Rottenness entered my bones and I trembled where I stood. If you've never had that moment or haven't had that moment recently, may I just say this as politely as I know how. You need to pull your head out of the sand. See the world for what it is, not what you want it to be. Church, if our eyes and our ears have become so numb that the depravity and the pornography and the corruption and the immorality and the wickedness and the malice and the greed that we see and experience and 
witness on a daily, second-by-second basis, moment-by-moment in our lives, if that doesn't bother your spirit, if you've never been jolted and moved to great concern or even tears for the lost and dying world that surrounds us, then I just want to urge you to open your eyes and pay closer attention and start asking God to help. Not just to help them, but to help you to understand what to do and how to respond and how to react. Ask God to help you see the world for what it is, not what you want it to be. I I get it. Many would rather ignore the world and just pretend that it's not a problem. I totally understand why. I want to do it too. It's a lot easier to do that. It's much more convenient to do that. It requires a whole lot less effort on your part to do it. But it's also very, very dangerous to live with your head in the sand. See, Habakkuk saw it for what it was. He saw the world for what it was. But even in his tears, there was transformation. His tears were transformed. Consider his concluding words in verse 19. The Lord, my Lord. He doesn't just say the Lord. He makes it a point to say my Lord. His personal Lord, His personal God. He says, The Lord, my Lord, is my strength, and He makes my feet like those of a deer and enables me to walk on mountain heights. Yeah, His heart hurt for the world around Him. His heart was saddened and sorrowful over what was happening in His own culture and the looming threat of the enemies at His borders. But he allowed his tears to be transformed into thanksgiving and gratitude because he knew that God was in control and that God was able to do all things and that God's timing was perfect. Once again, we see that gratitude is the key. We can shed our tears and acknowledge the sin and suffering of the world and allow those same tears to be transformed by God's grace. But that's only possible when we're thankful and forever grateful for who God is and what He does. And particularly for what He's done through the cross of Calvary and the gospel. Gratitude is the key for transforming our tears. Every single sinner on this planet, every single sinner in this room, every single sinner who can hear me on the radio or who's watching on social media, Every single sinner has something to be thankful for, and every single saint does as well. And you know what? It's the exact same thing. I want to close with what Paul said to the Romans so you can see it, whether you're a sinner or a saint. Romans 5, 6 through 10, for while we were still helpless, at just the right time, because God's timing is always perfect, Christ died for the ungodly, for the sinners. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more having been reconciled will we be saved by his life? You see, what we are grateful for and thankful for, whether we are sinners or saints, is that God would send his one and only son from heaven to earth. Not because he looked at it as a globe against a black backdrop with pretty water and green forest and swirling clouds. It was beautiful and majestic. But because he is a God who knows the mind and the heart of every man, woman, and child. Because he is a God who counts every hair on our heads. He looked down and drilled in and zoomed into this place and said, you know what? They need a savior. The only one qualified for the job was his son, so he sent him. And that Savior didn't come to preach to us. He came to die for us. He didn't preach eloquent sermons or teach us eloquent things and then just vanish and disappear. No, he died for you on a cross. He shed his own blood because he was the sinless lamb. He was the only one qualified to shed it. And he died for you. And even in the tears, and even in the tension, and even in the the tragedy that that death on Calvary was, you know what we see? 
triumph. Because three days later, he rises from the grave, conquers death, and makes your life in eternity and mine possible. Every sinner and saint alike finds their gratitude at its source in the gospel of Jesus. It has nothing to do with what's happening in your life or in our world. It has everything to do with what happened long ago on that hill. When he breathed his last and then breathed again three days later. My friends, if you have never accepted the grace and the love and the peace of God, if you do not have the gospel at the center of your gratitude, may I encourage you to call on him today because the Bible says all you have to do is repent and believe and confess and you will be saved. Every single one of you. If you have never done that, call on him today. And no matter what happens for the rest of your life, you will have something to be grateful for. A treasure in the face of tension, turmoil, tragedy, whatever it is, there is a treasure waiting there for you. Gratitude is the key and the gospel is where it comes from. Let's pray. If you're here or can hear me this hour and have never given your life to Christ and desire to do so, to accept this free gift of love and grace and mercy, then I invite you to pray with me right now. Just say, Lord, it's me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I have gone astray. So I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out, that you would make me new. Lord, I ask by faith that you would forgive me. I thank you for your grace and for your goodness for your love and for your mercy. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for making a way for me. Lord, as we prepare to close, we are so grateful for the good news of the gospel. We are so grateful for the work of the cross. We're so grateful for the words of Habakkuk who could somehow sense and experience all of that within his own time and day that he was just grateful that you were his God. Grateful that despite all of the troubled times that surrounded him, there was a treasure in his gratitude that allowed him to unlock doors of peace and joy and hope. Lord, we... We can't look at our planet from thousands of miles away. We can only see pictures of it. and We can long to live far away where it looks so pretty and peaceful, but you have put us here and now and confined us to this globe where we are surrounded by the tension that comes to us from every side. And so, Lord, I pray that we wouldn't bury our heads in the sand or pretend that it's not there. Lord, I I pray that we wouldn't try to explain it all away, but that we would just continue to be grateful people. That we would continue to use that key to unlock those doors. That we would trust you and your timing. That we would let our tears flow, but also let you transform them. That, Lord, we wouldn't get so wrapped up in our circumstances, or whether they're good or bad, that we would start putting our hope in stuff that doesn't matter. That our focus as your people and your church would always be on you, your love, and the gospel that you have shared with us through your son. Lord, help us to do that, not just here and now during this hour, but there and then as we walk out of these doors and go wherever it is you're calling us to go. We ask, we pray, we believe these things now in the name of your son Jesus. Amen.